Network attacks. Objective: to understand what a network is, how communication happens in a network, how network attacks are classified based on the OSI model, physical layer attacks, data link layer attacks, network layer attacks, and transport layer attacks. Outcome: on completion of this chapter. The participants will understand how IT systems communicate with each other using a network, and how network attacks are performed based on physical layer, data link layer, network layer, and transport layer. Network basics: What is a network? When two or more systems or electronic devices are connected or linked together, it forms a network. Consider this network. This network has three LANs, namely ETH0, ETH1, and ETH2, connected to the internet via a router and a modem. Notice that there are different devices linked together in this network. But have you ever wondered how these communicate with each other? Imagine an Apple computer and Windows-based computer want to communicate with each other. It is like French and German communicating with each other. Do you think there is a possibility for good communication? Yes, if there exists a common language known to both. Say, for example, if both knew English, it would facilitate the communication between them. In the same way, in order to accomplish a smooth communication between systems and networks of different architectures, OSI, Open System Interconnection Model, was introduced. OSI defines a layered framework for the travel of data from one system or network to another. It has seven layers: physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. Each layer in this model performs its respective tasks by communicating with the layers above and below it. Take for example that two systems, say a Windows and a Mac, communicate via a chat application, wherein the Windows system is the sender and the Mac system is the receiver. Suppose if the Windows machine sends a welcome note, such as "Hi Mac," via this application, the data travels via these seven layers and reaches the destination after being operated upon by the underlying protocols. But what happens when the data travels through these layers? Let us take a look at the user interface that allows the Windows system to chat with his peer. This is where the application layer plays its role, controlling the application that allows it to communicate, along with the UI's look and feel. The application can also be a browser, a file sharing program, or something else. As mentioned, this layer has its own protocols, such as HTTP, HTTPS for web applications, FTP for file sharing. And SMTP and POP3 for the sending and receiving of emails, respectively. In this case, the application is the chat client. Once the data, that is, Hi Mac, is typed in and sent, the control gets transferred to the presentation layer. The presentation layer checks for the OS compatibility, encryption, and compression of the data before passing it on to the next layer, which is the session layer. The session layer is the one that provides the mechanism to manage sessions. That is the active time of a user on a particular web application. The session ID is assigned for the current session, and the data now gets passed onto the transport layer. Study on the OSI model reveals that the top three layers are called the web interface, where one can see the data being passed on without adding any specific headers. The three layers at the bottom are called the network interface. The transport layer is the one that acts as a mediator to shoot the data out as well as receive the data in. As the name says, this layer is responsible for the transmission of the data. It converts the data into segments of a limited size with a segment number for easy reassembling at the other end, along with a header called the transport layer header, which is either based on TCP or UDP. Let us take a glimpse at these protocols. TCP. Transmission Control Protocol is a connection-oriented protocol, which, when used, sends a probe using this TCP header. 
It consists of source port. It is through this port the client gets connected to the server. Usually the source port is an ephemeral port, which is nothing but a short-lived transport port assigned automatically from a predefined range that is always greater than 1024. The destination port is a well-known port on the server whose range falls between 0 and 1023. Sequence number, acknowledgement number, data offset, window size, check sum, erg pointer, and six other flags. To ensure a connection-oriented communication, it uses a three-way handshake wherein these six flags play a major role. A flag is a one-bit Boolean field to mark the occurrence of an event. Let us get to know how these flags are helpful in a communication. When host A needs to send data to host B, connection initiation is done by setting up the synchronization, shortly SYN, flag in the probe. When host B receives this probe, it sends a reply probe with reset flag when it is not available for communication. Otherwise, it sends a reply probe with synchronization acknowledgement, shortly SYN ACK. On receiving this, host A sends a probe with acknowledgement, shortly ACK, to impart that the connection is established, and then it starts sending the data. This is called a three-way handshake, and this process of connection establishment makes TCP a connection-oriented protocol. When the data transmission is done, the sender can send a probe with finish shortly fin flag, which closes the connection. Apart from this, while in data transmission, a push flag can be set along with the data that would instruct the system to send data immediately. Or an urgent flag can be set, which will inform the receiving station that certain data within a segment is urgent and prioritize the delivery of this data. Next comes the user datagram protocol, which, when used, consists of this header. One may notice that the header consists of only the source and destination addresses, along with the length of the data, its checksum, and the data to be sent. Since it does not wait for any acknowledgement for establishing a connection and for transmission of data, it is called a connectionless protocol. This protocol is best when used for query response or streaming. TCP is a reliable protocol when compared to that of the UDP, since it establishes a connection using the three-way handshake, ensuring a connection-oriented data transmission, while UDP simply transmits the data, terming itself to be a connectionless protocol. In terms of speed, UDP is faster than that of TCP, since this one does not wait until the recipient acknowledges any data transmission. Once the headers are appended, this layer concentrates on handing over the data to the appropriate application process on the host computers, wherein the control is transferred to network layer. Network layer is responsible for the host-to-host -host delivery of data segments from the transport layer, this layer adds a header called the IP header, consisting of the source and destination IP address, which is similar to that of putting a letter into an envelope with a from and to address, thus converting the segment of data into a packet of data. So, what is an IP address? Similar to that of a physical mailing address, Internet Protocol Address is a logical address that uniquely identifies each and every system connected on a network. At this point, it is important to know whether the communication is going to happen between systems inside a network, that is, baseband communication, or out of the network, that is, broadband communication. The routing of packets from the network layer is taken care by the network layer device called a router, a router is a device that connects two different networks. It works based on IP addresses and routes the data packets along the network on deciding the next point to which the packets need to be forwarded. It acts more or less like a dispatcher. To put in simpler terms, the router acts like a traffic cop who forwards the traffic to destined places either from and to the internet or within the same network. Thus, the data is now transmitted to the next layer, the data link layer. This layer is further divided into two sub-layers, Logical Link Control, or LLC, and the Media Access Control, or MAC. LLC ensures reliable data transmission by appending sequence number to each transmitted packet before sending 
and sends back an acknowledgement for each received packet. When the MAC layer receives the data from LLC, it interacts with the physical layer below. This is responsible for creation of frames from the packets it received from the network layer on appending a frame header and frame trailer. Switch and hub come into play at this layer. Unlike the router, the switch and hub cannot connect two different networks. However, a layer 3 switch can act like a router. Switch is a device that works based on the MAC address, that is the unique number assigned to each and every system in their network interface card. This device ensures point-to-point -point delivery of data. A hub is a device similar to that of the switch, wherein the difference lies in the delivery of the data. A switch is a unicast device that concentrates on point-to-point -point delivery, but a hub is a broadcast device, and the data reaching the hub is broadcasted to all the other devices connected to it. Finally, the data reaches the physical layer, wherein the frame is converted either as a digital or analog signal, that is bitstream, and gets passed on via the wires, if the network is a wired network or via air, if the network is a wireless one. Basically, this is where the network hardware seen facilitating the functions of the data link layer and the network layer get into action. As seen already, when two or more systems or electronic devices are connected or linked together, it forms a network, and these connections are made possible via connection cables. An Ethernet cable is one of the most popular forms of network cable used on wired networks. Ethernet cables connect devices on local area networks, such as PCs, routers and switches. The physical layer thus forms the fundamental for all the communication, and it is revealed that 95% of network-related communication issues arise at the physical layer. Once the physical routes to deliver the bitstream, either as analog signals in a broadband communication or digital signals in a baseband communication is identified, the data is routed to its destination. Finally, the receiver gets the data in bitstream and the corresponding headers for all the layers are verified and the application layer now displays the message to the MAC system. This is how communication happens between systems on a network. Having seen how communication happens between systems, one might have noticed that certain parts of the network here have not been touched upon at all. Let us get into knowing these things. Did you see that the router is allowing traffic that seems to be legitimate, while it discards the illegitimate one? This is because a firewall is configured at this point. What is a firewall? A firewall is a system that filters the incoming and outgoing traffic to avert unauthorized access to or from a private network. All messages entering or leaving the intranet pass through the firewall, which examines each message and blocks those that do not meet the specified security criteria. As such, a firewall can be described as stateful and stateless. When a firewall is termed to be stateful, it is capable of monitoring the entire content of the data packets, that is the traffic stream passing through it, and distinguish the legitimate packets that belong to different types of connections. When a firewall is termed to be stateless, it is capable of capturing only the source and destination IP. It does not monitor the entire traffic stream and does filtration based on the source and destination IPs alone. Did you notice the IP address of the router and the systems in the LANs are different? Why is it so? Just imagine a tech giant like Microsoft, which holds n number of systems to run their processes. If each and every system is assigned with a unique IP, the range of IPs available will surely be exhausted at some point in time. To overcome this issue, the ICANN or Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, a non-profit organization, takes care of the coordination and maintenance of the databases of the unique identifiers, that is, IP addresses, and came up with the concept of subnetting. What is subnetting? The process of dividing an IP network into subdivisions is called subnetting. Computers belonging to a subnetwork have a common group of the most significant bits in their IP addresses. The addresses used for subnetting fall under the following series 10.x.x.x series, 
to 172.31.255.255 and 192.168.x.x series. When these multiple subnets with a common prefix are combined to form a large network, it is called supernetting. The IP address assigned at the router point is the public IP, and this entire network connected to this router is identified with this IP by the other systems on the internet. The IP address of each and every system inside the network is its private IP. This IP is not known outside the network. So how is it ensured that the data packets to and from the public network are delivered properly from and to the system in the private network? Here comes the role of the router. The router is configured to support a concept called NATing. NAT, Network Address Translation. The process of translating a private IP into a public IP is called NATing. When there is no large network and you just want to connect a router to two different systems in your home network, the concept of patting comes into picture. Port address translation is the process of assigning port numbers to the internal IP address of the machines connecting to the internet. This now facilitates the data transmission. Although all these implementations seem to be effective, the study on the growth of internet devices in recent times shows that the time where one internet device was used by at least four to five members has gone, and each and every individual now owns at least two to five internet devices, which eat up the available public IPs. This clearly shows that the number of machines connected to the internet exceeds the number of people alive on the earth. That's where the introduction of IPv6 came into play, which is of 128 bits in length and ranging between the following address space. This is how a network is and how the systems here communicate. Introduction. Having seen how a network is and how communication happens inside a network, let us dive deep into how network-based attacks are performed at each and every layer of the OSI model. Physical layer attacks. The mere concept of a physical attack implies that you have direct physical access to the systems on the network. Physical layer attacks include the following. Eavesdropping. Inserting a hub. And vandalizing. Data link layer attacks. This is the second layer of the OSI model, which works based on the MAC address of the devices connected in a network. Data link layer attacks include the following. MAC spoofing, MAC flooding, ARP poisoning, DNS spoofing, DNS poisoning, DHCP starvation, and rogue DHCP attack. Network layer attacks. The network layer works based on the IP address of the systems connected in a network. Some of the attack vectors that disrupt the communication at this layer of the OSI model include IP spoofing, sniffing, MITM, ICMP flooding, Smurf, ping of death. Transport layer attacks. The transport layer is the one responsible for the transmission of data across the systems in a network. The attack vectors that disrupt this transmission include TCP flooding and UDP flooding. MAC spoofing. Certain free services offering web applications use this MAC address of the end user to terminate the free service after a specified time. At such times, one would like to trick the web application into believing the system to be another one by masking the MAC address called MAC spoofing. This can be done manually by opening My Computer, Manage, Device Manager, Network Adapters, and selecting its properties. Traversing over to Advanced tab, one may spoof the MAC address to any 12-digit hex value in the Network Address text box. Let us now check whether this got updated by scanning the systems in the network using Kane and Abel. Here it is. Your spoofed MAC is seen here. Data link layer, MAC spoofing. Media access control, or MAC as it is called, is the unique physical address on a system's NIC. 
Masking this MAC address is called MAC spoofing. Task. Spoof your MAC address. Step 1. Open Device Manager, Network Adapters. Step 2. Right-click on the system's network adapter and select Properties. Step 3. Traverse to Advanced tab and select Locally Administered Address and key in any 12-digit hex value in the Network Address text box. Results. Open Command Prompt with Administrative Privilege and type in ipconfig slash all you may find the spoofed MAC address of your system. Cafe Latte. This attack allows obtaining a web key from a client system by capturing an ARP packet, manipulating it, and sending it back to the client, which subsequently generates packets that are captured and cracked to determine the web key using Aircrack NG. Having landed upon this web enabled network in preparatory phase, a Cafe Latte attack can be done in three steps. 1. Launch of the attack. 2. Capture packets. 3. Crack key. 1. Launch of the attack. Having done with the prerequisites for launching the attack, let's get into launching one. The command when given makes the attacker wait for a gratuitous ARP from any of the associated clients of the AP and grabs it to form ARP requests of its own and sets up a fake AP. Gratuitous ARP is a packet that is broadcasted by a client by setting the source and destination IP to itself and the DEST port to this address, which is nothing but the broadcast port for resolving IP conflicts, updating ARP tables, etc. This GRAT ARP packet is captured to make one that will look like a legit one, and this is broadcasted to the network claiming the attacker to be the AP by changing its SSID to that of the legit AP. This will now dissociate the client from the legit AP and start associating the client to the fake one, thus making the client send back replies that would be encrypted with the legit key. 2. Capture Packets it's time now to capture the packets from the clients associated with fake AP to crack the password. Starting AeroDump NG using this command on WLAN 0 now will capture the packets and save it to the file named CAFE. ARP requests from the fake AP now generates many genuine ARP replies from the clients that are captured in the file named CAFE. 3. Crack Key Now that the large number of packets transmitted between the AP and the client are captured in a file, opening the same file with Aircrack NG allows cracking the WEP password. Aircrack NG uses FMS and PTW attacks that are nothing but a form of cryptanalysis for attacking RC4 stream ciphers and do not need many IVs, that is, packets, to crack the key. The Cafe Latte attack allows cracking of wireless packets in an average time of 6 minutes, being the best case, while 2 hours to crack being the worst case. The next encryption mechanism incorporated by this hotspot is WPA. What is WPA and how is it different from WEP? WPA WEP uses a 40-bit or 104-bit encryption key, which do not change and needs to be manually entered at the access point and clients. To overcome this weakness, WPA came into existence. WEP generates a per-packet key by concatenating the IV directly with the passphrase or master key, which exposes the master key to carry out attacks such as FMS and PTW attacks. WPA stands for Wi-Fi Protected Access, which works based on two mechanisms, namely PSK and TKIP. The PSK is a client authentication method wherein the network admin assigns a passphrase containing up to 133 characters. This passphrase is XOR ED with Keystream, which is a combination of a random 32-bit key with IV, 
which is nothing but the checksum of 32 bit in length to generate unique encryption keys. These encryption keys are constantly changed on a timely basis, which is then shared between the clients associated with the network. When a new client gets connected to the network, authentication request is sent to the access point, which in return sends a response asking for the password. A connection is established once the password is verified. PSK Pre-shared key is simple and was designed for small offices and home networks that do not require an authentication server. However, the encryption keys tend to become old as time changes, since these keys are not generated dynamically upon login and are subjected to brute force and dictionary attacks. This paves a way to opt in for the second authentication mechanism, TKIP. Temporal Key Integrity Protocol enhances WPA by increasing the length of IV by adding an extra 32 bits to the original 24 bit, accounting to 56 bits to generate a unique encryption key for each client. However, only 48 bits are used in practice because one byte must be thrown away to avoid weak keys. Supposing for the communication between two clients connected in a network, TKIP takes an extra precaution by ensuring that the data packet has not been altered or modified in any way by the attacker. If the data packet seems to be altered, it is dropped off. This is achieved by the 64-bit message integrity check, commonly known as the Michael algorithm. TKIP employs a per-packet key mechanism to dynamically generate a new 128-bit key for each incoming packet. This avoids the same keys staying in use as they do with WEP. TKIP also provides a re-keying mechanism in which it changes the encryption key of an ongoing communication in order to limit the amount of data encrypted with the same key.